Modern. 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 We're prepping for a voyage. Modern. The force of an old fashioned equals whiskey mass times bitters acceleration. Why don't you make that a double? Modern Bar Cart. What's shaking, cocktail fans? Welcome to episode 163 of the Modern Bar Cart podcast. I'm your host, Modern Bar Cart CEO Eric Koslick. Recently, we had the great honor to be featured in the New York Times, along with a bunch of other noteworthy beverage podcasts, in an article called Seven Podcasts to Serve Shaken or Stirred. And as a result, we have a bunch of new subscribers to welcome to the community, which makes me super, super happy. So I think it's only fair that after a couple blockbuster interview episodes with Caroline Rosen of the Tales of the Cocktail Foundation and Ivy Mix of Landa, author of Spirits of Latin America, that we should give our new listeners a taste of something a little bit different here. That's right, this is a Barkhart Foundations episode where we go narrow and deep on a single topic in the beverage world in an attempt to make you an overnight expert, or at least give you a little inspiration for your next drink project. This time around, we'll go well off the beaten path to learn about a few cocktail ingredients that you've probably never heard of. But before we get too far ahead of ourselves here, I think this is the perfect opportunity for you to make yourself a drink. Staying on theme with the episode, this week's featured cocktail ingredient actually comes to us courtesy of Lagoon of Mystery on Instagram. Great tiki handle, by the way, who messaged us following our recent interview, as I mentioned, with Caroline Rosen, in which we discussed the Hurricane cocktail. It was brought to my attention that there's a side to the hurricane that may involve everyone's favorite tiki maverick, Ernest Gant, a.k.a. Don Beach, a.k.a. Don the Beachcomber, who, like the hurricane, has ties to the city of New Orleans. Actually, since we're talking tiki here, could we get a little Exotica soundtrack playing instead of the uh, usual jazz music? That's better. So, as I was saying, we've got this fella, Ernest Gant, and if there's one thing he's known for above all else, it's making these exotic tasting syrup mixes with fruit juices and spices, and keeping the ingredients completely coated and secret. Don's mix is one famous instance of this, but... Fashionola may very well be another prime example. And this is the ingredient that Lagoon of Mystery encouraged me to look into a little bit more. So that's exactly what we're doing here. Now, another thing I find telling about Gant is that his life somewhat mirrors the problems he causes us almost a century later when trying to decode his drinks. First off, there are conflicting accounts of his birth, with some indicating New Orleans and others indicating Texas. In an oral history interview he did in 1987, three years before his death, Gant claims to have spent time growing up on the north shore of Lake Pontchartrain, right across from New Orleans. In theory, this would place him in rough proximity to the speakeasy that Pat O'Brien ran, which is about all I can really say definitively about the ties between Don Beach Fashionola and the Hurricane Cocktail. Because so much of his life was about myth-building, secrecy, and misdirection, most cocktail historians recommend taking Gant's claims about his life before establishing Don the Beachcomber with a heavy grain of salt. However, here's a couple things we know for sure. Number one, some of the drinks Gant developed definitely incorporated Fashionola, which is a blend of tangy fruit juices and sweet syrup talk about exactly what ingredients go into it in just a moment here. And number two, in attempting to imitate some of Gant's drinks, his primary competitor, Victor Bergeron, aka Trader Vic, employed a similar blend called Passionola. And I'm not the kind of guy who ignores obvious rhymes like that. So even if we can't say that Fashionola is an ingredient developed by Pat O'Brien specifically for the Hurricane cocktail, by Don Beach, or by someone else entirely, one thing I can say with confidence is that it's probably what makes the Hurricane Cocktail bright red, unlike the grenadine I mentioned a few weeks ago. 
And one thing that most tiki nerds agree on is that Fashionola should taste like fruit punch, tangy, sweet, and almost too easy to sip when mixed properly in a drink. Now the recipe for Fashionola is another bone of contention among cocktail scholars because if you think the history is murky, wait until you try and wade into tiki blogs and all manner of other publications spouting their take on the ingredient. It certainly doesn't help that Don Beach employed not only red Fashionola but also green and gold variants, all with different flavor profiles. Nonetheless, I think I found the recipe that I would use if pressed into service at a tiki bar. So to keep things simple, that's what I'll be sharing with you here. This recipe for red fashionola comes to us courtesy of past guest Matt Petrick, author of the book Minimalist Tiki, which is currently nominated for a Tales of the Cocktail Spirited Award for Best New Cocktail Book. He calls this his analog fashionola recipe because it takes the regular stovetop work of creating a simple syrup completely out of the equation instead leveraging the inherent hydrophilic properties of sugar to draw juices straight out of the fruit. I'll read the important parts of the recipe for you here on the air, but if you're really into tiki drinks, you need to visit Matt's blog, cocktailwonk.com, and follow him on Instagram at cocktailwonk and at rumwonk. To make Matt Petrick's analog fashionola, you'll need the following ingredients. One cup strawberries, moderately chopped, one cup blueberries, moderately chopped, one cup freshly cut pineapple, also moderately chopped, and then we've got a couple optional ingredients here. One would be lemon peel for a little of that essential oils. Another would be something like mango, raspberries, or in Matt's words, whatever else you damn well please. And then finally, the last ingredient, the sugar that makes this analog fashionola, you need as much sugar by weight as you have fruit. The basic production steps are as follows, but for process shots and step-by-step -step instructions, please, again, follow that link on the show notes page straight to Matt's blog. First, of course, you gotta chop all your fruit, then weigh it on a kitchen scale and add, as I mentioned, an equal amount of sugar by weight. You're gonna mix that all up in a bowl, can leave it in the fridge overnight, then the next morning, stir it, and after roughly 24 hours has elapsed with the fruit and the sugar mingling together and you stirring occasionally, you can strain out the solids, leaving only what's going to be a red liquid. At this point, you're gonna to need to add the last ingredient, which is passion fruit puree not passion fruit syrup, very important detail there. And this ingredient is a sleeper because you're gonna to need to add about a quarter as much puree by volume, not by weight here, as you have syrup. So you can't exactly figure that out until you've strained your fashionola. So if you have 20 ounces of fashionola syrup, you're gonna to wanna to add five ounces of puree to that, just as kind of an example. Matt adds the following note at the end of his recipe, quote, let me be very clear. What we're making here is a fruit salad heavy on the berries. Nothing in the above ingredient list is cast in stone, so use whatever the heck sounds good to you. If it evokes the flavor of Kool-Aid when you're done, you're on track, end quote. To me, Matt's recipe has a bunch of things going for it, the most important of which are its ease of execution, right? You don't even need to heat up this fashionola, and its flexibility. Especially when dealing with an ingredient that has such a murky history. I hate when people pretend that their version is the end all be all, and Matt very explicitly sidesteps that, leaving us in charge of developing our own house fashionola recipes that we can customize to our heart's content. P.S. If you're looking for an authentic tiki drink from Don the Beachcomber to enjoy that also features Fashionola, I'd recommend the QB Cooler. It's an original cocktail by Ernest Gant, and it has a cool backstory of its own. But like so many things in the world of tiki, the QB Cooler is a story for another day. So, now that we've achieved a bit of resolution on the fashionola front, let's jump right into this Bar Cart Foundations episode where we discuss even more cocktail ingredients you've never heard of. Enjoy. I'd like to begin this voyage into strange and wonderful drink ingredients by taking a second to talk about novelty. What makes us crave it? 
One possible answer is that humans are great at pattern recognition and more specifically identifying when something breaks a pattern. This goes back into our evolutionary hinterlands where you can picture a group of proto-humans picking out the shapes of predators in tall grass. It makes sense in this respect that evolution might reward those creatures who seek out novelty in their environments by allowing them to live long enough to pass along their genes, making the search for novelty a common trait among humans today. And we know it's literally ingrained in our genes because countless studies have been run demonstrating the preference of even newborn babies for novel stimuli time and time again. It's one of the best documented phenomena in the entire realm of developmental psychology. But somehow, the search for novel flavor experiences feels different. I mean, could you make an argument that it's our body's way of making sure we have a diet diverse in essential vitamins and micronutrients? I guess you could. That sounds plausible to me, but that's not exactly an ironclad explanation for why distillers are constantly experimenting with weird cask finishes on their whiskeys, or why bartenders are obsessed with smoking, clarifying, fermenting, and infusing with all kinds of weird stuff. However you choose to think about the role of novelty in your personal or culinary life, one thing is certain. When you're stuck at home and all your favorite bars and restaurants are closed or doing takeout during a pandemic, things can get a little bland, a little monotonous. Whether it's that same room you sit in day after day or the realization that you've been cycling the same five or six staple meals over and over for months now. This is why we're seeing a surge of new home gardeners, bakers, and mixological experiments taking the internet by storm these days, because flavor has that magical ability to transport you in memory or imagination to places that are much more interesting than your kitchen or your couch. Personally, you're never going to see me jump out of a plane or bungee jump off a bridge. Those aren't the kinds of thrills I seek. But if there was an equivalently risky behavior that described crazy things you pass over your taste buds, I'd consider myself quite the daredevil. So if, like me, your palate has been experiencing a bit of wanderlust during this pandemic, I hope you'll get excited about some of these unusual cocktail ingredients, many of which you may have never heard of. The first ingredient I'd like to feature actually came across my radar while researching Fashionola. It's called Pog Juice. And if you're wondering if it has any connection to the 90s game fad that involved slamming towers of decorative little discs, the answer is, actually, yeah, it does. The name POG is actually an acronym that stands for Passion Fruit Orange and Guava. And it was developed in the early 70s by a company called Haleakala Dairy in Maui, Hawaii. Like Fashionola, Pog Juice is a sweet and tangy blend of fruits that can be used to add depth to many contemporary tiki drinks. And I say contemporary here because I'm not aware of any occurrences of it as a unified ingredient in any classic tiki cocktails. Doesn't mean these juices didn't all coincide in certain classic tiki drinks, but if they did, they were used as individual agents rather than as a fruity supergroup. Now, the question about how this fruit juice blend relates to the game of pogs. Well, it's all about the caps. Basically, these were sort of like milk caps used on the jugs that contain this pog juice. And there's a great little documentary that I will link to on the show notes page over at modernbarcart.com forward slash podcast showing how this game took first the island of Maui by storm, and then was turned into sort of an international fad in the 90s. It, it's a really, really funny documentary, and if you have any sort of 90s nostalgia, it will drive you absolutely bananas. So go ahead and check out that video over at modernbarcart.com. Next up on our list of weird and wonderful cocktail ingredients you've never heard of is ambergris which is the coagulated, excreted, sun and sea hardened cholesterol of the sperm whale. In some book about a whale, Herman Melville describes it as follows, quote, Now this ambergris is a very curious substance and so important as an article of commerce that in 1791, a certain Nantucket born Captain Coffin was examined at the bar of the English House of Commons on that subject. 
for the first time and indeed until a comparatively late day, the precise origin of ambergris remained, like amber itself, a problem to the learned. Though the word ambergris is but the French compound of grey amber, yet the two substances are quite distinct, for amber, though at times found on the seacoast, is also dug up in some far inland soils, whereas ambergris is never found except upon the sea. Besides, amber is a hard, transparent, brittle, odorless substance used for mouthpieces to pipes, for beads and ornaments, but ambergris is soft, waxy, and so highly fragrant and spicy that it is largely used in perfumery, in pastiles, precious candles, hair powders, and pomatum. The Turks use it in cooking and also carry it to Mecca, for the same purpose that frankincense is carried to St. Peter's in Rome. Some wine merchants drop a few grains into claret to flavor it. Who would think then that such fine ladies and gentlemen should regale themselves with an essence found in the inglorious bowels of a sick whale? Yet so it is. By some, ambergris is supposed to be the cause, and by others the effect of the dyspepsia in the whale. How to cure such a dyspepsia, it were hard to say, unless by administering three or four boatloads of Brandreth's pills, and then running out of harm's way as laborers do in blasting rocks." End quote. To be honest, this was like my favorite part of Moby Dick, which is as much a discourse on the state of the whaling industry at the height of its prominence as it is a revenge tale where a bunch of guys die at sea. Now, here's the next thing you need to know about ambergris. It's illegal to possess in the United States. Now here's the next, next thing you need to know about ambergris. It's actually recognized by the FDA as GRAS, or generally recognized as safe, as a food additive. So why does the FDA permit ambergris as a food additive, and yet people aren't even allowed to possess it? Well, unfortunately, it is also possible to harvest ambergris directly from a sperm whale which is like way illegal. There's actually a description of this in Moby Dick, but the whale in question is found already dead. So it's icky in the gross way, but not as much icky in the unethical way, but still a little icky in the unethical way because, you know, killing whales is bad. According to a number of articles I sourced, it's been roughly two decades since people have even received letters of warning for possessing or selling ambergris in the US because of the three following reasons. A, ambergris is most often found washed up on beaches, making its collection completely harmless to sperm whales. B, ambergris collected from a slain sperm whale is generally of much poorer, read, non-culinary quality because it hasn't had the time to cure in the salt and air of the ocean. And C, these two factors paired make it completely silly for anyone to go out killing sperm whales for poor quality ambergris. It's just not a lucrative proposition. So suffice it to say, ambergris is still illegal to possess here in the US for highly symbolic reasons, but it's one of those laws that you're just not going to see enforced, which means a bunch of aspiring bartenders have been using it for over a decade to gussy up their cocktail menus. Regarding the taste of ambergris, most people in the perfume world use it as a musky fixative. In other words, a thing that keeps the stank on your skin longer. After all, it is a type of fat, and fats are good for that sort of thing. But when it's properly aged, battered for years by waves on the high seas, many describe its incredibly potent bouquet as a sophisticated brininess, almost like umami for your nose. Our favorite 18th century gastronome, Jean-Antoine Briat Savarin, author of The Physiology of Taste, was fond of putting ambergris in his hot chocolate, and King Charles II of England enjoyed it as a seasoning for eggs. In fact, it's rumored that ambergris was used to conceal the odor of whatever poison was slipped into the king's breakfast on the morning that he died. In cocktail applications, you'll see people use it in tincture form, which is a great way to extract flavor from fats, but you'll also find it grated in very small amounts into large format punches. In fact, the only time I've ever had ambergris in a cocktail was when Dave Wondrich crashed a cognac presentation by Maison Ferrand during Tales of the Cocktail 2016. I believe it was 2016. He helped the cocktail apprentices whip up a brandy-based punch, and 
included a little bit of ambergris, and I gotta say it was pretty tasty if my memory serves me correctly. The last thing I'll note here is that there seems to be some sort of tradition of using ambergris in a beverage called Negus or Negu Punch. There's an article by past podcast guest Derek Brown from 2011, which I'll link to in the show notes, outlining the process for this drink. So if you're looking for a place to start with your next freshly acquired lump of whale cholesterol, that might just be the place to start. This next duo of cocktail ingredients comes to us courtesy of a recent Facebook post by DC bar owner Jojo Valenzuela, who runs The Game and Tiki on 18th. He's one of my favorite people in the DC hospitality scene, and he's a huge champion for Filipino flavors, which often represent a fusion of Southeast Asian and Spanish cuisine. Hailing from the Philippine archipelago, two cocktail ingredients you've probably never heard of before are lambanog and pandan, the latter of which Jojo recently featured in an article on liquor.com, which we'll link to, of course, on the show notes, and we're going to give you that cocktail recipe in just a few minutes. Lambanog, however, is the logical place to start because it's the national spirit of the Philippines, and the history of this beverage goes roughly as follows. When the Spanish arrived to colonize the Philippines in the 16th century, they found that the natives were drinking a palm wine called tuba, made from fermented coconut or nipa palm sap. There's some uncertainty about whether Filipinos were actually distilling that palm sap before the Spanish arrived, but there are records of both primitive wooden stills made with barrels and wooden troughs, as well as more sophisticated metal contraptions that sprang up later on following the Spanish acquisition of the islands. Finally, within a century or so of the Spanish arrival, there were hundreds of distilleries operating both legally and illegally to make Lambanog, which would be considered a palm brandy or palm wine eau de vie using today's spirits classification terms. Now, there's an interesting question here about what we know and what we don't know about how distilling technology spread across the world. Is the rustic Filipino style still a low-tech version of the Alembic still that came to the Spanish by way of the Arabs who invented it, or is the Filipino style still something that cropped up on its own through contact with other pre-Columbian distilling cultures? Interestingly, this is also a major subject of debate in the Mezcal community, where you'll find a good number of Filipino style stills that date back roughly to the time of Spanish colonization, or according to certain scholars, perhaps earlier than that. I bring up this question because I just can't find any good scholarship on the subject, and my main concern here is being able to give credit to cultures that were distilling before contact with European colonial powers. A definitive answer here won't change the importance of Lambanog or Mezcal in their respective cultures, but I think it would help us understand just a little bit more clearly how information and technology spread around the world or arose independently in a number of different places at the same time. History is all echoes and reverberations, and if you want to really grasp an historical subject, it pays to track those sounds to their source wherever possible. Today, Lambanog plays a similar role that vodka might in Filipino drinking culture. You can get the traditional unflavored stuff, or you can opt for one of the newer flavored variants on the market for mixing with various sodas, etc. It does find its way to the U.S., but remains one of the least known spirits on the American market, which means that there's lots of room to explore this really interesting traditional category. Now, Getting back to pandan. This is a leafy palm-like plant native to Southeast Asia that's used in a whole boatload of culinary applications where it's employed alternately as an herb, a green food coloring, a garnish, or even as an air freshener. Sometimes the leaves will be woven into baskets for the purpose of steaming rice in order to impart a bready, nutty, slightly rich flavor to the dish. You don't really want to eat pandan. It's kind of tough and stringy, but it does make for a striking aromatic garnish, and you can also infuse the leaves into a spirit or a syrup for a really striking color and flavor experience. The recipe for Jojo Valenzuela's pandan-infused daiquiri riff called the Don Quixote is as follows. 
one and a half ounces of Don Q crystal rum, one ounce mango pandan syrup, which is a pandan infused simple syrup with some mango puree blended in, one half ounce fresh lime juice, and one half ounce Appleton Estate 12 year rum for a little bit of richness, sweetness, and depth. You combine all these ingredients in a cocktail shaker with ice, give them a good hard shake, then strain into a rocks glass over crushed ice and garnish with a dehydrated lime wheel. It's a gorgeous drink, and it's a really fun way to incorporate Pondon into your next cocktail experiment. Personally, I'm stoked to try both Lombinog and Pondon sometime soon, so I hope you'll join me in keeping our collective eyes open for places that serve or sell these quintessential Filipino ingredients. Next up, we've got another duo of ingredients, but unlike everything we've been talking about so far, these are a little less natural and have a bit of a spotty past. They are acid phosphate and aromatic spirit of ammonia. Both these ingredients, which kind of sound like they belong in a chemistry textbook, hail back to a time when soda fountains and the jerks who tended them were wildly popular. Let's call this time period roughly the first half of the 20th century, where pharmacies were often found on the main streets of small town America. The soda fountains that drew thirsty patrons to these establishments, possibly while waiting for an order from the druggist, offered sweet and tangy concoctions of all sorts, from plain old sparkling water to egg creams to root beer floats. One trend in the 1800s that sort of paved the way for soda fountains is the popularity of sparkling water as something of a health tonic. Even before the soda shop became a mainstay of American culture, the wealthy elite were huge fans of drinking flavored fizzy waters to alleviate their headaches or other little maladies. But as technology continued to evolve, soda fountains became much easier to install and maintain in public venues, making them something not just reserved for the rich. This represents another thread in the intertwined history of booze and medicine. These soda fountains resided in pharmacies partially because druggists already had the tools and knowledge to create concentrates and carbonate them. But, turns out, if you give a pharmacist a soda rig, he's really likely to start throwing things like booze, cocaine, or opium in your soda. And around the turn of the 20th century, all these things were still considered medicinal in their own ways. Another movement that was taking off around this time, of course, was the temperance movement, which is a bit too complex to get into in any detail here, but the general thrust of it is that alcohol was considered bad for families. So if, as a politician or a public figure, you claimed to be pro-family, well, to the temperance movement and the anti-saloon league and all the numerous voters that they controlled, that meant you kind of had to be anti-booze. This is why soda shops were able to continue thriving during Prohibition because even though pharmacies were putting some really questionable stuff into some of their concoctions, it wasn't, for the most part, alcohol. So it was pretty okay by temperance movement standards. As the decades march on, past the Roaring Twenties into the Great Depression, then World War II and beyond, the ingredients used in fountain drinks got less dangerous and a little more desserty. But one tangy category of drink that remained somewhat popular was the phosphate or acid phosphate. In a similar way that you'll see fancy bartenders today making acid-adjusted orange juice or crystal clear daiquiris using a blend of citric and malic acid, phosphate soda drinks were carbonated long drinks often flavored with fruit syrups with the addition of a little tincture that contained food-safe phosphoric acid supplemented with calcium, magnesium, and potassium. According to cocktail writer Wayne Curtis, quote, acid phosphate does two bewitching things to a drink. The acid gives it sourness without making it taste like anything in particular, and the salts enhance existing flavors, much as they do with food. The various elements of the drink, sweet, sour, bitter, sharp, are each discernible, but none is overwhelming. Adding a teaspoon or so of acid phosphate makes a cocktail seem slightly off-center, and makes your tongue tingle." End quote. Today, many savvy bartenders use acid phosphate in a similar manner to what Curtis describes, as that little pinch of acid and salt that brightens a flavor profile and accents the other notes in the drink. 
The first time I had one was probably around 2013 or 2014 at a brunch spot in DC called Founding Farmers. And I gotta say, it was a refreshing way to extend that old brunch time tradition, the hangover cure. Speaking of hangovers, don't forget about aromatic spirit of ammonia, our other chemical cocktail ingredient of note. According to an article on artofdrink.com, it's a 10% solution of ammonium hydroxide mixed with water, alcohol, and the essential oils of lemon, nutmeg, and lavender. Back in the 1800s, aromatic spirit of ammonia was used as OG smelling salts to prevent fainting or revive someone who had already fainted. In fact, they're still available today at many pharmacies right alongside the heavily ammoniated smelling salts found in most first aid kits. This compound was also said to have anxiety-reducing properties, which may be explained away by the placebo effect. But one thing is for darn sure, ammonia is a base, which means it can neutralize acidity. So if there's one thing I could actually see this substance being useful for, it would be dyspepsia. Although aromatic spirit of ammonia isn't nearly as popular behind the bar as acid phosphate, it does have its own signature drink, the ammonia coke. By adding just two or three milliliters of aromatic spirit of ammonia to a standard glass of coke, you'll notice a marked drop in acidity from the cola, as well as some pleasant top notes from the lemon oil, lavender, and spice. This is one additive I would really like to see used more behind the bar because I really dig the way it acts as both a flavored tincture and a pH modifier. Rarely are you going to come across ingredients that pull double duty so effortlessly, which is, I think, a really solid reason for folks to start experimenting. If you're able to pick up a bottle of aromatic spirit of ammonia, I hope you'll hit us up on Instagram or Facebook at Modern Bar Cart and share your experiments with our community. But word to the wise... Be very careful as you measure out these drops because the aroma and flavor are quite potent. Rounding out this little romp through often overlooked and esoteric cocktail ingredients, we've got a real stinker. The preserved medial and distal phalanges of the human hallux, which is another way of describing a pickled human toe. As you might expect, pickled toes aren't super popular in the craft cocktail world. It's not like you can just order one as a garnish for your next Gibson or Dirty Martini. But one particular pickled human toe was the inspiration for a Canadian group called the Sour Toe Cocktail Club. For more about this obscure ingredient, I need to quote directly from an article by CBS Canada, which reads, Quote, the Sour Toe Cocktail is practically a rite of passage for visitors to Dawson City, Yukon. It's a simple drink, a shot of whiskey, usually Yukon Jack, with an unusual accompaniment, a mummified human toe. How did the Sour Toe Cocktail come to be? It all started during Prohibition with a nasty case of frostbite. In the 1920s, the rum-running Lincoln brothers, Louis and Otto, got caught in a blizzard. Louis put his foot through a patch of ice and soaked his foot. When the brothers got back to their cabin, Louis's right foot was frozen solid. To prevent gangrene, Otto used his axe to chop off Louis's toe. He placed the toe in a jar of alcohol to commemorate the event. In 1973, legend has it that Captain Dick Stevenson found the jar and the toe in a remote cabin. He came up with the idea of the Sour Toe Cocktail Club, an exclusive club with one membership requirement. In order to gain admittance to the club, potential members must drink the legendary Sour Toe Cocktail. There's just one rule. You can drink it fast, you can drink it slow, but your lips must touch that gnarly toe." End quote. Now, if you didn't think this story could get any weirder, of course you're wrong, because in 2013, a wait for it, New Orleanian named Joshua Clark came in and swallowed the mummified toe of Louis Lincoln. This put him on the shit list of toe master Terry Lee, and although they have been able to continue the tradition with a backup toe, 
Since that fateful day, the damage was done. Clark immediately paid the $500 fine for swallowing the toe, but was subsequently banned from the downtown hotel where the tradition continues to take place. There's a really fun 20-minute documentary about this whole situation on YouTube, which we'll embed on the show notes page, where Joshua, the guy who swallowed the toe, returns to Dawson City, Yukon, in an effort to make amends with the toe master and the rest of the locals. It's actually a really great little watch, especially if you have a drink in hand, so I won't spoil it for you in case you'd like to head over to the show notes page and see for yourself how this story concludes. I'm Modern Bar Cart CEO Eric Koslick. I hope this brief, silly little foray into a few cocktail ingredients you've probably never heard of has been both intriguing and maybe even a little exciting for you. Please hit up the show notes for links, pictures, videos, and lots more resources. And until next time, remember, you should only put a toe in your mouth if you first obtained consent. Cheers. Hey everybody, thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, there's two big things you can do for us here at Modern Bar Cart. One would be to tell your friends and family if you think they'd enjoy listening to us talk about cocktails. And if they don't download podcasts, they can always stream our episodes on their desktop directly from the show notes page at modernbarcart.com. The other thing you can do to help would be to head on over to iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts and leave us a review. Five stars are great, but we're more interested in your feedback. And the beauty is, the more reviews we have, the easier it will be for other folks out there to learn about our show. We're trying to start a cocktail revolution here, and by spreading the word, you're helping us fight the good fight. You can always reach us by emailing podcast at modernbarcart.com if you're looking for cocktail or bartending advice, or if you're a pro who would like to pull up a mic and be interviewed for all to hear. Also, definitely follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Modern Bar Cart for cocktail porn, recipes, and entertaining tips. And keep an eye out for new product releases and special offers, which are happening all the time. We love our listeners and we really enjoy giving you exclusive discounts and sneak peeks at our latest and greatest cocktail projects. This episode may be over, but for you, the mixological fun and adventures are just beginning. So remember folks, drink responsibly and experiment boldly. This episode was made possible with editing and sound design by Samantha Reed, original music by Patrick Kilgannon, and a little bit of research magic by yours truly. This has been a Modern Bar Cart production, copyright 2020.